I think where we are is that the original plan that was agreed between Theresa May and uh, the Backbench Commission, the 1922 Executive Committee Chairman Graham Brady, was that in uh, two and a half weeks' time there would be the second reading of this uh, new improved uh, deal that she wanted to put before Parliament, and then afterwards, it wasn't specified which day, she would meet him and give a timetable for leaving. I think the effect of today is that, in fact, she's going to be meeting him on Friday, this Friday, the day after the European Parliament elections, and he's going to be expecting to agree a timetable for her leaving then. And I think that means that we are not going to get, probably, to the second reading of the bill. Her announcement to stand down could come uh, on Friday, could come next week, could come just the week after, maybe a week on Tuesday, uh, when Parliament is back after a break, when the state visit from uh, uh, President uh, uh, Trump uh, is underway. It, all the dates are awkward, everything is awkward, but she will try and agree something which is sooner than people had originally thought. The, the, the crisis that has absolutely triggered this is Theresa May making that speech yesterday about the new improved deal and, as far as some cabinet ministers were concerned, going beyond what they felt they had agreed in cabinet. They were trying to push her back. She was trying to reach out to Labour MPs. They were trying to uh, push her back from that. They feel she went too far in not just saying that uh, a second referendum uh, vote would happen in the House of Commons. Uh, that was bad enough, but that uh, the government would, if it passed, uh, facilitate a second referendum. That was just toxic to them, toxic to those people in the cabinet, particularly perhaps, who were thinking of running for the leadership. There's no way they could vote, they felt, for that, because that would antagonise the Tory party membership. So the question for them was, what do you do? You need to stop it. Do you try to depose her? I think some of the, there were serious discussions in the campaigns uh, around leadership contenders today about how you mustn't do that because you don't want your DNA on the murder victim if you actually got rid of the Prime Minister. And so what they decided to do was uh, they should uh, push, them, push them out the door, get them to go and tell the Prime Minister to her face that they couldn't support the bill as currently written. Those meetings that were then planned to facilitate that exchange of information didn't happen. One of them, I understand, was cancelled about 10 minutes before it was uh, due to happen. But I think we are looking at a shorter timetable, a significantly shorter timetable. What does all of that mean? I think that in the big picture, Theresa May had a deal. And with her, I think you've got to say there's every chance that a withdrawal deal ends with her end. It, it, there is no other leadership contender who is going to, uh, has a chance of winning, who is going to say, I'm going to uh, negotiate that deal. And there's a very decent chance that the contenders who get down to the final two and whoever wins may not be ne able to negotiate any deal with the EU. So what we're looking at, if you remember all those sort of logic trees we've been looking at throughout this entire crisis, a giant branch breaks off with Theresa May going when she goes because the idea of leaving with a deal looks much more remote and the idea of uh, leaving with no deal, a second referendum or revoking uh, uh, Brexit altogether or a general election, those things look more likely. Talking of elections, of course, this is the eve, as you said, of the European elections when normally you're focused on getting the vote out, but the Tory party today focused on getting the Prime Minister out. This is a great time to be alive, a great future. What a difference a day makes. If Theresa May thought the new Brexit deal she proclaimed yesterday stood a chance, her own ministers and backbenchers today put her right. She's flogging a completely dead horse by uh, introducing this bill. I think that she should abandon that. And I'm afraid to say that beyond that, I think she has to recognise that I think she has personally come to the end of the road. Uh, support for her, for her within the party is, is dissipating to the extent of being almost non-existent. At the end of the day, um, our system has a self-cleaning mechanism which will go on, and that's how it works, I'm afraid, in both parties, in all parties. You know, leaders are only there as long as they have the support of their colleagues, and um, that support, it appears, has been ebbing away. What will you be talking to the Prime Minister about? Uh, that will be a matter for me and the Prime Minister. Will you be asking for her to step down? I, I'm not uh, discussing what I uh, would say to the Prime Minister in a private uh, discussion. The Scottish Secretary was one of a handful of Cabinet Ministers who asked to meet the Prime Minister this afternoon. Like the Home Secretary and the Foreign Secretary, David Mundell was concerned. She'd offered Labour MPs more on a second referendum on Brexit 
than had been agreed at yesterday's Cabinet. Morning. Do you fully support the Prime Minister's New Deal? Well, I'm looking very carefully at the legislation today as leader of the Commons. That's my job and making sure that it delivers Brexit. Thanks you don't often hear a Cabinet Minister clearly saying she was marking the Prime Minister's homework. Some Cabinet Ministers told the Chief Whip that they could not support the withdrawal bill as described by the Prime Minister in her speech. They never got the one-on-one -on -one meetings some wanted with Theresa May herself. Will you still be Prime Minister in a week, Mrs May? She came to the Commons at midday to sell a deal she already knew was badly cold. In the end, our job in this House is to take decisions, not to duck them. So I will put those decisions to this House because that is my duty and because it is the only way that we can deliver Brexit. The Prime Minister couldn't even get the compromise deal she wanted through her own Cabinet. And it's clear that the shrunken offer that emerged satisfied no one. Many Tory MPs didn't bother to turn up for what would normally be a packed event. The benches opposite concentrate on ways to mount a leadership coup and where are they? That's exactly what they're doing this afternoon because they're not here to support the Prime Minister. Some were talking tactics with their preferred candidates for the succession. Some Tory MPs were trying to get the 1922 executive, which sets the leadership rules, to force the Prime Minister out of office immediately. It's falling away now, so it's difficult to see how she can manage to t change tack and to garner support again, and that's the real issue. So 22 committee will almost certainly have to make some decision, uh, literally now. It leaves a few Brexiteers queasy about what will follow the end of Theresa May's premiership and her deal. If she goes without Brexit being resolved, uh, we are facing a catastrophic general election and perhaps we're facing a second referendum, the whole thing being stopped, the Labour government. You see my point? And this is the Brexit debate. All this on the eve of the European Western. Parliament elections. Who would have this expected this introduction in an, an online debate to these vote. two faces? And today I'm joined by the two people heading up the party at the top of the latest opinion polls. Sir Vince Cable. Order. Order. Parliament rose early again, just before half past four. Brexit legislation piled up at the door for want of votes to pass it. Well, joining me now is Theresa Villiers, former Northern Ireland Secretary, and Steve Baker, who's Deputy Chair of the ERG Group of Conservative Brexiteers. Theresa Villiers first. Um, you have not called for Theresa May's resignation to date. Is it now time for her to go? Well, I can understand why she wouldn't want to step down on the eve of a major national election, but I think in the coming days we do need to have a timetable for the Prime Minister to stand down. I'm afraid we've really reached the end of the road. We need fresh leadership in the Conservative so Party. by Friday, basically, she's, she's got to be going. I certainly believe that that would be an important step forward uh, for the Conservatives and for getting the government back on track to ensure we actually deliver the Brexit that people voted for. So you've pushed her out. Are you content? Well, th this is a horrible situation. It's a question of being content. After I resigned, along with Boris and David Davis, we said this was not about the policy. This was not about the person. It was about the policy. And I'm afraid now it is about the policy and the person. The two are intertwined and the Prime Minister has really run out of road. Now we've rejected a deal three times. I'm confident it would have been rejected a fourth. So it's not a question of contentment. This is a, an awful period for everybody. But she said in the Commons today, MPs have a duty to, quote, take decisions, not to duck them. I mean, you're pushing her to the limit. It's an impossible position to be in to try and lead her fractious party through this mess. Really, There's absolutely it? no doubt that this was always going to be a difficult lead for any Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. But Theresa May decided to take this on. But I have a long history of intimate acquaintance with events, which I've put on the record and people will find elsewhere if they Google it. I've set out what happened. But it, back in March 18, Dexu Brexit ministers took a decision to go for an FTA-based Brexit. And a few weeks later, that the EU, a free trade agreement-based Brexit, a few weeks later, the EU offered us that kind of exit. We, we I was, probably haven't got time for the I was rejoicing, now, but bring us up to date. I was rejoicing, You've but that, wasn't, to get but that wasn't good enough for the Prime Minister. Right. And that is the ultimate source of all these difficulties. She tried to keep us much more highly aligned to the EU. It was never going to work, and that's why we're where we are. It's why we tried to remove the Prime Minister before Christmas. OK, she's had an impossible task, though, hasn't she? She's trying to keep the party on board and to negotiate a Brexit. 
Brexit, many believe, is an impossible task. Well, it was always going to be incredibly difficult. We're a divided country and a divided parliament. But what the Prime Minister hasn't done is to seriously ask the EU for that kind of style trade agreement that um, Steve was just talking about, which Donald Tusk offered. And also, her government has acknowledged that the alternative arrangements put forward under the so-called Malthouse Compromise for the Northern Ireland border are workable, and yet she hasn't pressed them in Brussels. That's what we need a new Prime Minister to do, to take seriously that work and negotiate with the EU to get the backstop out, but to still ensure that we have an invisible and compliant border in, on the island of Ireland. Can Boris Johnson do any better? I mean, a lot of people in Europe refuse to even speak to him. But you've, you've got, I mean, for example, Michel Barnier himself has acknowledged that the kind of checks away from the border is something that is feasible in practice. It happens today in Rotterdam. You know, the proposals I and others have put forward are actually based on existing technology, on existing legal flexibilities in operation on borders in other parts of the world. It is not an impossible conundrum to, to solve. But can Boris solve it? Does he have your vote tonight? I haven't decided who I will back in Keeping the your powder dry. when it comes. The next Prime Minister needs to be somebody who believes in what we're doing, who knows what to do, why, to, why we're doing it, how to get it done, who to bring in to provide the expertise. Now, it's by no means settled who that will be, but it is clear that in the polls of members, Boris is in the lead. But, you know, Dominic right. Raab's a very, he talented, get, right. he's a very talented man as well. But I do think that the next leader needs to be someone who really believes in what we're doing. You're all hedging your bets. Well, thank you very much for You're joining welcome. us both. I think we can now be joined by Nikki Morgan. Yes, I can see her lurking here. <laughs> um, so you have long supported Theresa May and you've sort of kept her deal going. Where, where are you now tonight? Well, look, I said in the comments today, if the bill were to come before the House in June, I would vote for it. Um, but actually, I think that if the bill were to come past and then to be defeated, the consequence of that, where we end up either with a no-deal Brexit or a revocation of Article 50 facing us, are so serious, I hope she won't put the bill before the House. And I think that it's now time, very sadly, to, to start the leadership process, to give that opportunity to somebody else to potentially put another deal together that can command a majority in the House of Commons. Who is that somebody else? <laughs> well, I'm not going to indulge in personalities. And I, you know, I've just heard what Theresa and what Steve were saying and everything else. I mean, at the moment, I think we've got the, the initial uh, issue, obviously, is uh, talking to Theresa May about her leadership, thinking about the right thing to do with the bill and with Brexit. Then there'll be people who put themselves forward. Well, will you put yourself forward? No, I'm not going to put myself forward. I don't think I'm, I'm the right person. Yeah, I have ruled it out. I Does don't, it have not... to be a Brexiteer, though? Because we've had a Remainer in there. Well, they haven't managed it. I, I think there is an element of, um, I don't think it has to be somebody who has always been a Brexiteer, but I think it's got to be somebody who does accept, I'm reconciled to the results. There are other people who are more enthusiastic who didn't vote for it. I think it's you know, someone like that who says, here's the opportunity, but this is how I'm going to take both the 52 and the 48 to a deal. Could you back Boris? Uh, I don't think Boris is going to be my preferred uh, candidate. Um, I diplomatic. love the fact that he is um, appealing to One Nation Conservatism, which is something I've been championing for many, many months. Let's see who stands. Very briefly, can the Conservatives survive this? The pre predictions are they're going to go down to the worst ever result at a national ballot tomorrow. Well, look, I think in the end of the day, the European elections, we've had some pretty bad results in the past of the Conservative Party. And, you know, it will be very interesting to see what the result is and all the rest of it. Um, but this is not a general election. Yes, the Conservative Party can survive. But I've been saying for months, the Conservative Party can survive if Conservative MPs and party members decide they want to survive. I think most of us do. We need a centre-right party in the UK political system. This is going to be a very difficult couple of weeks. No God-given right to survive. No. Of course not. No, no party has that. But I do think, as I say, we always need a centre-right voice in British politics. Um, let's see what happens. Nikki Morgan, thank you very much for joining us. Well, that's all from here for now. Let's go now to Jackie in Downing Street. Thanks very much, Cathy. Welcome back to Downing Street. In the last few minutes, the Chief Whip, Julian Smith, has arrived at number 10. And we understand that the Prime Minister has arrived at the back gate, coming back from her planned regular meeting with the Queen. So outside of all the wranglings over the Tory party leadership, they also have an election to worry about. Tomorrow, around 400 million people across Europe will go to the ballot box to elect MEPs to the European Parliament. It's the election the UK never thought it would be part of. But here we are. And leading the polls is Nigel Farage's Brexit party, with the traditional major parties trailing by a distance. 
Joining me now from a studio in central London is the chairman of the Brexit party, Richard Tice. He's also standing as a candidate in the east of England. Mr Tice, thanks very much for joining us today. Is Pleasure your to party's more. greatest weapon the incompetence of all the others? Well, I think that's partly uh, our success. But also the truth is that voters, you know, they voted for Brexit. We were told over 100 times by this prime minister we were going to leave on March the 29th. We're not. People have lost trust in democracy. And people, I think, are going to clearly vote tomorrow. We hope uh, that we will win and we will win big. But we want people to vote clearly to send a big message back to Westminster. Actually, what people want is a clear, clean WTO Brexit so that we can all get on with our lives and we can maximise the opportunities you, of Brexit. You, you know that this push for no deal, the Chancellor, endless economists, business people, politicians on all sides of the House say it will be disastrous. It will make well, people poorer and people did not vote I tell you what, to become I tell you what, poorer. It's interesting, isn't it? We had all these threats and scaremongering before the referendum and the voters ignored it. And we believe that the voters will ignore these threats yet again because they've all been proven to be completely wrong. And who do we trust? You know, if you believe in democracy, then actually you trust the people. And the truth is, if we have a WTO Brexit, then the jobs that are now being put at risk just today with British Steel in the north of England, tens of thousands of jobs, then actually the government would have been able to save that company and you know, that would have reduced, uh, removed uh, all of this uncertainty. This is, this is really important because you know, at the moment the government cannot save British Steel because it cannot uh, provide state aid to that company. When we leave the European Union, and if we'd left on the 29th, then the government could have stepped in. A WTO and removed Brexit, the, removed Brexit that pulls the UK out of one of the most advanced trade agreements in history. Which country trades on WTO rules do you think the UK sh should aspire to? Well, what's the role model? Uh, over 160 other countries around the world who are not members of the European Union trade under the umbrella of WTO rules, and they have the freedom to do deals with other countries of the world around the world. And we have a huge opportunity with, with countries like America, with our Commonwealth partners, to do quick, fast, sensible, smart trade deals. That's the opportunity, and that's where the growth... Uh, so of, just of, very That's quickly, where the future growth is. It's interesting, isn't it? The European but just Union's name one country. Sorry, the question was to name one country that you think is a role model for the future under WTO Brexit. Well, I've just said that over 160 other countries in the world operate under the umbrella of WTO rules. We, as the fifth largest economy in the world, have the opportunity to be in control of our economy, to decide when companies of strategic national interest like British Steel should be saved in our national interest. And at the moment, sadly, we're not able to do that because we didn't and, leave the European British Union Steel on the 29th has, has of March. And British Steel has said the threat of Brexit, the uncertainty over Brexit, has in part led to this decision today. The truth is the opposite. The truth is they had to pay £120 million in uh, payments to the European Union because we hadn't left on March the 29th to do with uh, some of the, uh, the emission trading schemes. If we'd left on March the 29th, they wouldn't have had to make, make those payments and the government could have stepped in and saved that company, which is of a strategic national interest. It's worth noting, no, over 90% of the rails, the tracks that are used by Network Rail are made by British Steel. You talked, that is all under threat. You talked earlier about trust. You are promising as a party to d dismantle the old discredited politics, the old elites that you keep talking about. Nigel Farage has been living a pretty elite life, funded by Aaron Banks. First, he denied it. Then, under pressure, he admitted it. That's pretty much old, discredited, ugly politics, isn't it? I tell you what it is, it's old news. You're talking about events that took place between two and three years ago. What we're now talking about is the Brexit party and my role as chairman. No, but it's we're, we're just six it's weeks a point old. Of trust. No, you no, talk about I, trust. Well, it's in interesting. Politicians. I tell you what, it's let, important about let, trust, isn't let it? the voters tomorrow tell us all who they trust. And we're leading in the polls. We think voters will, they will give us that trust because they know that the quality of our candidates and the simple, clear message that we you offer... You have no of a manifesto, WTO, you have no policy apart from we have no a, we deal. Have a, Don't the voters deserve more than that? Well, what else can you offer them? What else can you, know you what, tell them about you know what? what you're offering them? You talk about trust, we trust the voters. The Westminster establishment may not, we trust the voters, and we believe that they're going to vote for us significantly tomorrow and that we will win and that we have the opportunity to win big. And do you know what? We could well be the largest single party in the whole of the European Parliament from a standing start just week, six weeks ago. That is the definition, in my view, of trust in new, competent, and capable people. And you can tell people. any voters concerned about it that Aaron Banks 
is no longer funding Nigel Farage's lifestyle. I can tell you that Aaron Banks is not involved in the Brexit party whatsoever. We're funded at the grassroots level by over 100,000 supporters who've joined in the last six weeks, paying a registered supporter fee of at least £25. Pounds. So that Aaron is, Banks that isn't is funding that is, Nigel Farage that is the anymore. Most... You, can, you, can, you can assure people this of is, that. Look, you keep harking back. Do you know what I'm voters are doing? Question. Voters are looking forward. They're looking forward to a new party they can trust with competent, capable people talking about competent uh, leadership as the country has taken and, forward and, and moved forward. And they can trust you even though you won't answer that question? I think, well, we'll see what they trust tomorrow, won't we? I'm, I'm very happy to answer questions about the Brexit party, about me, my role as chairman, and that's what voters are interested in. They're not interested in Aaron Banks and who funded what two or three years ago. You're looking Richard backwards, Tice. the country is looking forwards. Richard Tice, thank you very much thank for joining you. us today.